Well, good morning. Again, once again, we're at St. Peter's. And we're going to be continuing our discussion of the soil of Christianity is Judaism. Now, the way that I actually prepared the lesson plan is to talk today about the rule of God, or otherwise known as God is sovereign. But I'm going to do that next week. So this is going to be a bit backwards. So hopefully after we finish next week, you'll be able to put the two together in the proper order and have it make sense. And the reason I'm doing that is because there was um, a request to go over this, Galatians 3.16, where we see that Paul says that those that are believers come from Abraham's seed, singular, not Abraham's seeds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out, again, a, a, a bit of the backdrop to provide uh, texture and context to our discussion of what Abraham's seed is, so that when we finally get to it, after I talk about these things, it should, like Tetris, fall into place. All right? Okay, so as you see, I put Galatians 3, 14 through 16 up there. Verse 16 is the verse in question. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And that's from the New King James. Now, we're going we're gonna to meld that into our discussion this morning. And this is one of those days where I'm going to be teaching a little differently. As you've probably figured out, uh, I teach Socratically. I'll say something and then I'll ask questions and try and get an interaction. Um, today I'm probably just, at least for the first part, I'm going to be doing a bit more uh, lecture. We're talking about the soil of Christianity being Judaism, right? And we've seen some things already. I will guarantee that if I ask you this question, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask it for a response. It's going to be rhetorical. If I ask you this question, you'll all have the same idea, and it'll be, okay, that's Exodus. How significant is the Passover to Christianity? Or, stated in more broad terms, how significant is the Exodus to Christianity? Now, if you're the average Christian in the pew, you probably look at Exodus as a one-off. And you think in terms of this, okay, I know that Yahweh stepped in, I know that Yahweh redeemed Israel, now let's get to the New Testament. What I'm going to show you this morning is why this, combined with this, becomes one of the most important concepts that you will engage in the New Testament. And we often take for granted the incredible and the far-reaching impact that the Exodus has on our understanding of the New Testament's presentation of the terms redemption and salvation. We use, we throw those terms around and we say, okay, yeah, I know what that means. But you don't, <laughs> unless you know this, unless you know the Exodus motif. So immediately in Exodus, we see Yahweh proclaimed as everlasting kingdom, as well as being revealed as his people's savior. In the Song of, so uh, the, song of the Sea, which Moses writes, we, it declares his kingship as well as his saving power. And this is Exodus 15 too. Yahweh, or in probably the majority of your translations, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. 
Exodus therefore provides the rest of the biblical record to form the language and the imagery for communicating the message of salvation. Right here. When you talk about salvation and redemption throughout the rest of Scripture, it starts right here. Okay? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the material that I'm using as the as the, the text for this is F.F. F. Bruce, New Testament Development of Old Testament Themes. It's a great little book, a little more than 100 pages, uh, and I'll be using that periodically uh, through, through the course of this section. And today is one of those days where I want to really use Bruce because he does a fantastic job of making the connections for us. He quotes an old uh, he quotes an old uh, Old Testament scholar. That's redundant. Uh, S. H. Hook. H. O. O. K. E. And Hook states this. And listen carefully to what the way he phrases this. We have seen obviously in scripture. Abraham's exodus from Ur, the exodus of Israel under Moses from Egypt, the exodus of the remnant from Babylon, and the exodus of the servant of Yahweh by the way of rejection and death from Israel's dream of national restoration. Now, once we move into the New Testament, from the transfiguration onwards to the final eschatological exodus. Now remember what eschatology means, right? It doesn't only mean end times, but it means the final, the consummation of something. Jesus is the eschatological king and priest and prophet. There's not going to be another one after him, right? But that gives you the idea of what eschatology means uh, in its full, robust meaning. So, from the transfiguration onwards to the final eschatological... Uh, from the transfiguration onwards, that final eschatological exodus begins. Okay? So, Jesus goes up to the mountain. He's there with Moses and Elijah. And right at that moment, we see the beginning of the final exodus. And what is the final exodus? Well, obviously, it's our redemption. Okay. We see Jesus with his face towards Jerusalem, leading an uncomprehending and reluctant company of followers, excuse me, who were to be the new Israel, carried with him through the waters of death, baptized with his baptism. Remember, that was one of the questions that the apostle asked. Can you be baptized with the baptism of which I will be baptized? And of course, yes, we will. He goes, yeah, well, <laughs> you will, <laughs> but not the way you think. <laughs> not going to be that easy, boys. So the exodus from Egypt then provides the details of the pattern of exodus or redemption as Abraham's departure from Ur doesn't. Okay? Just keep that in mind. We saw in Abraham the, the initial, if you will, exodus. But that's all we saw. He just left. He was called and he left. So there really wasn't a lot of background provided. Well, the exodus in Exodus fills in all of that detail. Abraham's departure from Ur is set forth as an example for the people of God in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look to Abraham your father, says Isaiah 51.2. The prophet, by way of encouragement, makes that statement to the exiles. For when he was but one, just Abraham, I called him, and I blessed him, and I made him many. All right? So, Exodus, redemption, beginning with one, but leading to many. 
All right? So that's going to come into play. Yahweh is bringing Abraham out of Ur and confirming his covenant with Abraham are cited by Ezra in Ezra, uh, excuse me, in Nehemiah 9 7. Now, I would read Nehemiah 9 7, but the context that explains this is literally the rest of the chapter in those 33 verses. So I'm not going to go through and read the whole chapter of Nehemiah. What I will say is this. Just go to Nehemiah 9-7 and read it to the end of the chapter and you'll see that here Yahweh, by bringing Abraham out, is referenced by Nehemiah as confirming the covenant. So in the New Testament, Abram's faith, excuse me, Abraham's faith, and his obedience are repeatedly held up for the instruction of who? Christians. We're constantly told to look back to Abraham's faith. So if you don't have an understanding of what this is and what is going on, how are you going to understand what the apostles are telling us in the New Testament when it says look back to Abraham's faith? Because then we've got to go through all of this that we've talked about the last couple of weeks. And then we have to unpack all of that. So it's good to know that when you read those verses, and you go, oh, I know, I only see Exodus, redemption, ultimately salvation of mankind, many nations. So as instructions for Christians, the New Testament references Abraham's life constantly. Specifically, his response to the call of God and his departure from his home. Abraham left not knowing where he was to go. God took him from Ur, and most archaeologists and uh, ancient Near Eastern historians will tell you that Ur <clears throat> was a fairly well-developed and advanced civilization. It wasn't as if Yahweh was looking at Abraham and saying, that cow patch you're living in, I'm going to take you out of that and I'm going to put you into this penthouse. It was exactly the opposite. Remember what happened. Ur was this incredible civilization and Yahweh was saying, okay, now, out. I want you to leave. And what am I going to do? I'm going to send you to this land that's occupied by murderers, sexual deviants, and the most repugnant creatures in the face of the earth. Show of hands, how many going? <laughs> how many of you are going to say, God comes to you and say, you like your house here in Tennessee? I want you to go move to San Francisco. <laughs> this is what Yahweh did with Abraham. I want you to leave this place and go to that place. And Abraham went because he believed in the word of God. And when we see this, it's not only used as an example, it is repeated. Remember, Stephen invoked this when he was about to be killed. The writer of the Hebrews talks about this, that we are, that we are and we should be, as Abraham's progeny, be aliens, strangers, and exiles on earth. So you see, says Paul, that it is men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Galatians 3, 7. So to the, to the Jewish exiles, then, coming out of Babylon, comes the oracle, the revelation of God through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 20, 33, which says, As I live, says the Lord, Yahweh, I added Yahweh, as, uh, as I live, says the Lord, Surely, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And that's why I say these lessons are inverted, because 
I would already establish what that kingship is, but we'll get to that next week. But we see the the involvement of Yahweh to those that were of the exodus of the captivity. Yahweh will be their king. Isaiah 40 through 55, those chapters. And I really would encourage you to take some time at whenever you can to read those chapters in reference to this context. Because the return of the exiles is represented in numerous ways. Isaiah presents a panoply of ways that the exodus from Egypt is recapitulated. Okay, so we're at Isaiah now, and, and we're at Ezekiel and Isaiah now, and do you see how everyone keeps referring back to this? This idea of Exodus. We haven't even gotten to Exodus 12. Yet. So, if at the Exodus Yahweh saved his people by making a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, and hopefully if we have the time we can go through what the significance of the sea and the waters are because that's also uh, incredibly important in scripture Yahweh then promises the children of the exile that when they pass through the waters he will be with them he will make a way in the wilderness and the rivers and he will make rivers in the desert Isaiah 43 verses 2, 16 and 19 so God is going to take that barren pain that dry desert, that misery that you were experienced, and he is going to give you rivers of life. And as he went before the Exodus generation in a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of cloud is not actually right, cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Notice that the pillars moved before them, in front of them, and behind them. So the generation then is protected. The cloud protects them from the scorching heat as they're leaving Egypt by day. The pillar of fire guards them at night and provides them warmth while they're camped in the desert. Because if you've ever traveled in a desert, you know that the the climatic the climactic changes Yeah, that's right. The climactic changes are extreme. I once drove from New York to California and I hit the Sierra Nevada Mountains during the day in August. 122 degrees. And I was on a motorcycle. When I stopped to get a room at 8 o'clock that night, the temperature had dropped down to 68. Now, 68 doesn't sound cold, but when you're talking about almost a 60-degree temperature drop, let's just say the hair on my chest was frozen. <laughs> it's cold. So here you've got this pillar of fire protecting them at night. See, if I had waited until you were taking this sip, it would have been perfect. <laughs> I never thought of the cloud and the pillar of fire as supplying them with anything. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always been out there where yes. they could see it. And it's the exact opposite because when we get, and, and I do hope we get to it, I think we'll get to it. When we talk, talk about the, tab, the tabernacle and the temple, I'll, I'll bring it back. The cloud and the pillar are the presence of God, and the presence of God in his person when we talk about the presence of God show up in First Kings and Chronicles. Because when we see the dedication of Solomon's temple, when we see the dedication of the tabernacle, what happens? The Shekinah descends. And it is it's so overwhelming and it is so powerful that in the tabernacle, Moses had to run out because he couldn't, and he was the one that had all of the privileges. He couldn't, he couldn't handle the presence of God. And remember Sinai. What happened on Mount Sinai? The cloud descends. That's the mobile throne room of God. 
beloved. That's what that is. Remember, God is a king, and his kingdom is the universe. And we'll get to that next week. His kingdom is the universe. So therefore, every king has a chariot, and every king has a throne. And when God decides to make appearances through the sky, he does it in his mobile throne room in the cloud. There's another thing for you to think about. Every time you read in Scripture the presence of a cloud, look very carefully and see what's happening here. Is it just a cloud? Or is it a cloud? Or is it the presence of God? And remember that when this happened on Sinai, what did the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain see? Lightning. Lightning and fire and thunder, and they were petrified. Isaiah 52, 12, in reference to all of this, says, For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. One of the most amazing pictures of the protective nature of God for his people. Okay? So we're talking about the extension of God's involvement in redeeming his people. So we're talking about movement. It's the picture of the Exodus. This Exodus is picturing redemption. And in this redemption, God is actively and visibly present with his people, caring for and protecting them. Well, you've taken him from being visible to interacting, which is a huge aha for me. Mm. Well, good. Now, that's the Old Testament. The analogies drawn in the New Testament are even more detailed. Especially when we're looking at the, the the picture of the deliverance between the accomplished redemption at the Exodus and the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. The very word redemption itself is drawn from the language of the Exodus and from the return of the exiles. As the people of God were, quote, redeemed from slavery in Egypt and later from captivity in Babylon, so in the fullness of time, they were redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ from spiritual bondage under the elements or the elemental spirits of the universe. Romans 3.24 and Galatians 4.3-6. through 6. So in one degree or another, in some degree, the New Testament sees certain phases of the Exodus pattern. The Exodus motif recapitulated in the personal experience of Jesus himself. Listen carefully. Yahweh says to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn. What did Yahweh say about Jesus in Mark chapter 7? The cloud descends, and he says, this is my beloved son. Right? in whom I am well pleased. That is Exodus 4.22 being cited by Mark 9.7. As Israel went down to Egypt and was brought back again, right? They were taken captive and then the Exodus. Matthew records the descent of the Holy Family into Egypt and back and applies it directly to Jesus. What the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Jesus have, out of, out of Jesus, out of Egypt have I called my son. This is Matthew 2.15. And it's one of those references you all should have picked up on when I asked you how many times Matthew references the Old Testament because he's literally quoting Hosea 11.1. Jesus' 40 days of testing in the wilderness of Judea parallels Egypt's 40 years of testing in the wilderness. And then, of course, at the hands of Satan. 
It is not by chance that Jesus replies to Satan in every single instance. And it is drawn from what book? Anybody know what book? When Jesus refutes Satan at every turn to three times? The world of flesh and... The, and no, you're close. Next book over. Next two books over. Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Jesus is, is, if you look at the cross references of Matthew 4, when Matthew, was when Jesus is interacting with Satan and refuting everything that Satan says, every quote that Jesus utters is directly from Deuteronomy. And the references will be Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, 13, and 16. So, Deuteronomy 6, 13, and 16. What was the reference to Hosea? 11, 1. Sure. And both periods of testing come as a sequel to a baptismal experience. Am I right? What happens? It passes through the waters. And Paul specifically states in Corinthians that this is the baptism of Moses. They went through baptism in 1 Corinthians. That's what Paul says. The rabbi, the scholar. By the way, if you don't know, Paul was probably 25 years old at the time and had two PhDs according to our equivalent education system. That's how brilliant he was. And here he is citing, he's citing the Exodus as it crosses through the Red Sea as being the preparatory baptism for us. Because then what happens with Jesus? John baptizes him and he's immediately led where? To his confrontation with Satan. So they're both described as a baptismal experience and Jesus' passion described in the Lucan record of the transfiguration is also a reference to his exodus which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Luke 9.31 Are you starting to get a sense as to why we need to understand the Exodus and the overarching influence and power it has on what we understand salvation and all of these things in the New Testament to mean. Go ahead, Ross. This is oh, there's a question. Maybe. But baptism. When I think of baptism. I think of sprinkling water. Sprinkling water. Sprinkling water. How is baptism? I know, it, I know it goes through the water, but I sometimes have a hard time. The definition of baptism, you know, walk, passing through a river versus being sprinkled with water. I know it has water and it's related. I don't know, make, am I asking that? Um, if I understand what you're saying, the first thing we have to keep in mind is baptism simply means to dip. That's all it means is to dip. I mean, I mean, I can extend it. I have a, I have on my shelf and my on, on my shelf where I, I deal with baptism. There's a book written by James uh, James Dale, and it's four volumes on that one word. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, I will tell you though, if you ever want to know anything about baptism, there's nothing he has he doesn't cover, especially when he talks about baptism in the Gospel of John. It's but anyway, um, so it, mean, it means to dip. We all get wrapped up on the mode. Is it sprinkling? Is it immersion? Do we have to, you know, somebody have to drown us for us to be back? Here, here's, the standard, here's the standard understanding, and it's probably the best, in my opinion, it's the best thing that you can hang on to. You baptize according to the individual. You sprinkle infants because you don't want to drown a kid in the water. But if an adult comes to you and says, the symbolism for me has more meaning if I'm immersed. I'm going to immerse them. 
Why? Because the mode doesn't matter. It's only evangelicals and Baptists that make a big deal about the mode. Why? Because it's connected to salvation. They connect the mode to an individual's faith. Or in other words, you can't immerse children because children can't have faith. That's the argument. Yeah. Question about conditional baptism. Uh, that's a little bit off the trail. Let's talk about that in a minute, okay? Okay. Let me get through this, but bring that up again, and we'll talk about that. Also, Sam, I've got an answer to your question. Um, I meant I didn't see you, so I didn't deal with it at the beginning, but I will address the question you asked the very first, uh, the very first lecture. I did not forget. Anyway, is that help with the baptism? No. I think so. I think I got to ponder it for a bit and maybe read a little more. Okay. Uh, are you? Are, is it the concern with the imagery of actually being in the water that is defining baptism for you? Um, no. Okay. No. Okay. That's, that's okay. not. Right. Well, if it's maybe it's just my head. Maybe no, that's fine. Think about it for a bit. I'm no, if you, you more. yeah, please. No, if you if <laughs> something comes, just yeah. let me know. All right. So, so here we have Paul saying they were baptized in Moses, right? You see Jesus being baptized before he's let out to confront Satan. Israel was redeemed from Egypt, how? By the Paschal Lamb. A lamb without blemish, as prescribed Exodus 12.5. <laughs> and what does First Peter say? That Christians have been ransomed, redeemed, we've been saved. And ransomed is a great, great theological term when we get to, uh, when we get to the atonement. Um, I'll, I'll bring that term back up. But we are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. 1 Peter 1.19 Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us says Paul and as in Israel the Passover sacrifice was followed by the week long festival of unleavened bread right let us celebrate the festival with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth 1 Corinthians 5.7 which is actually Paul alluding to the gospel of John 1936 and John's quoting Exodus 1246 but how long is our post paschal celebration remember they celebrated for a week after the paschal lamb was sacrificed well our paschal lamb has been sacrificed how long is our post Paschal celebration. Hopefully a lifetime. The rest of eternity. Okay? Israel passed through the sea, says Paul. I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But Israel passed through the sea, says Paul, again, being thus baptized unto Moses. And Christians, for their part, are baptized into Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 10.2, Galatians 3.27, and then compare Galatians 3.27 with Romans 6.3. Israel had manna from heaven and water from a rock to sustain and refresh them in the wilderness, right? We have the bread of life. And we have the living water in us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and following. And despite all these privileges, the generation that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness and never saw the promised land because of rebellion against God. So Christians need to take due warning against disobedience as their part might lead to a comparable disaster. I thought I saw a hand move to go up. No? Nobody? 
Is somebody was just getting ready to throw something? Okay. You will read a lot of passages in Scripture that seem to imply that once you're saved, if you sin, you can lose your salvation. Remember when we talked about you interpret the specific to clarify the general? Well, you also have to deal with the context, remember? The single most frequently used passage is Hebrews chapter 6, where it says that they were once enlightened, but they can never be redeemed again. Now it's important to realize that the context of Hebrews is whoever the writer was, and I think it was Paul, but whoever the writer is, that you can't, I mean, I can never prove that. I just, I, be, I believe based on the linguistic structure and the terms used that was Paul. But anyway, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians who would worship in the synagogues. And what the writer is saying is that you come into the synagogue, and you're a Jew, and you come into the synagogue, and you see all of these things. You hear the gospel of Christ. You see the bread and the wine as it points to the body and the blood. You see all of these things. You hear the word of God preached. You hear the connections between the Old and the New Testament made. You see the Christological fulfillment of all of that stuff. And if you reject that, how can you be saved? So, Christians can be chastised because we know our Heavenly Father disciplines His children Christians, now notice I'm using the term Christian specifically here. Christians can be disciplined. Christians can appear to have a season of regress and live a debauched life. But if Christ has truly redeemed you, he will never let you go. Ever. Remember what he says in John 10. All that you give me will be mine, and I will in no way lose anyone. Okay? But the warnings are still there because God can still discipline us if we sin, even as Christians. And this is part of the problem that we, and this is why I should have done last week first, but this is um, part of the problem that we have as Christians because we think God's just a really neat guy and he sits up in heaven in that classic rocking chair and he just kind of rocks back and forth and he's really not involved in anything. And then, okay, salvation for everybody. Let's have cake. And uh, that's not who God is. And next week when we talk about the rule of God, you're going to see who God is. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to make a... It's going to make every one of you uncomfortable. Every one of you. I guarantee it. Because there are times it makes me uncomfortable. Because you've been fed a bill of goods as to who God is. God's love and nothing ever bad, nothing bad happens to anybody. That's what you've been told. God really can't do anything about all of the problems going on in the world. That's what you've been told. When I read to you scripture next week and we get into who God is, you're going to have that proverbial come to Jesus moment. Because you're going to ask yourself, is this the God that I actually believe in? Remember something. Jesus taught on more than one occasion and in those occasions, what Jesus said drove people away. I had a professor that used to call it the 
the church reduction plan. What happened when Jesus started talking about his body and blood? Boom! Got see ya! <laughs> Not interested. What happened when Jesus started talking about the... Uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich into the kingdom of God. Boom! Gone! And what was the response? You guys going to leave too? That's Jesus asking the question. And Peter, God love him, gave the only answer you can go give. Where are we going to go? <laughs> you got the words to eternal life. I don't know where I'm going to go. All right. Um, Christianity is a sober religion. We all get this impression that, well, once you become a Christian, it's all a bed of roses. My life went to hell when I became a Christian. Because for the first time in my life, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm doing something wrong. I didn't even know what right and wrong was. So, in this, getting back to what we should have been talking about, in this, we have one of the basic texts that you that is used, the first Corinthians ten, is one of the basic texts that's used for the Old Testament in the New Testament. And it is used to apply a proper interpretation to things. And Paul writes in First Corinthians ten, five through eleven, these things happened to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come and the word that is used in there as example is the word that we use for type or typology have you ever heard of that you ever heard about a typology the lamb in the old testament is a type of christ in the new testament that's what paul is saying so all of those things that were happening back then, they're a type of what would happen, what would happening to us. Redemption, baptism, presence of God, etc. And the writer of Hebrews, who also emphasizes that final salvation has been provided by God at the end of the ages, Hebrews 9.26, underlines the lesson taught by Paul, where Israel in the wilderness had a promise rest before them but fail to enter it because of unbelief. So Christians may miss the rest that remains for the people, may miss that eternal rest that remains for the people of God if they in turn cherish an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. Hebrews 3.12 and following. And notice an un believing heart a heart that cherishes evil that indicates a heart of stone a heart that has not been converted when Paul reminds the Corinthian Christians that the Israelites in the wilderness had supernatural food and drink he has in mind not only the bread from heaven and the water from the rock but the spiritual and eternal reality to which these pointed Christ for them, as for the people of God today, Christ was the true source of strength and refreshment. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. The Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, specifically verse 15, where the God of Israel is his people's rock, where Israel waxed and fat and they were kicked back and then he forsook God who made he Israel forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. Do you see how that is understood? 
as Christ being our rock, who is the what? Chief cornerstone? But when trouble came upon them, and their sins overtook them, they remembered that God was their rock. The Most High God was their Redeemer. Psalm 72, 78, 35. Now this is the principle, A.T. Hansen uses this, that's called the real presence of Christ in the Old, Te- in Old Testament history. That Paul's statement, the rock was Christ, is an example of the real presence. Now, as Anglicans, we probably at one point or another should have heard the term real presence, right? Specifically, it's always identified with the Lord's Supper. But that's not the only place. A better understanding, and uh, let me, well, before, let me, let me say this. And we see in the understanding that the rock is Christ, the manna is Christ, But both of these should be understood more accurately as a sacramental presence. And let me show you what I mean by that. We're not going to get to this. Um, All right. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, everything above that line, everything up here is heaven. Everything down here is earth, all right? So, we have God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, right? Yes, we agree, that's okay, all right. Now, we have a number of elements in the Christian faith that directly relate to the Old Testament. We have, right, the Lamb. I'm just going to write a couple. I'm not going to write all of them. We have the Lamb. We have baptism. And I'm going to tell you a quick something about baptism in just a minute. But we have the Lamb. We have baptism. And then we have salvation in general. Man, I can't write on the board anymore. Um, Okay. When we say real presence, what we mean is sacramental presence. And what we mean by that is that at every case, in every way, the triune Godhead is present sacramentally, spiritually, by faith in each and every one of these forever. There's never a separation. It's not as though God says, okay, sacrificial lamb, that's done. Have a good day. No. Not only does the triune Godhead sacramentally identify and assume presence in that particular rite or act or event, but they remain and carry it forth through the consummation. So when you partake of the bread and the wine and you sacramentally partake of the body and blood of Christ, Who is the head of the church? Not a trick question. Christ is the head of the church. What is the body of the church? What is the body of Christ, excuse me? The church. Where is the church? Who dwells in the church? I'm sorry? People. Uh, Think about this. Holy Spirit. Okay. Ten... The body ever be separate from the head? Can the Holy Spirit ever be separate from the head? So they are eternally united, correct? The Holy Spirit in you, and as members of the church, is united to Christ in the heavenlies, so that when you partake of the bread and the wine, you are actually and really 
and truly in every way possible partaking sacramentally because of that union of the Holy Spirit and Christ in you, you are partaking of Christ. It's as if he's reaching across the veil of the consecration and he's feeding you himself. And that's what we mean by sacramental presence and that's what happens to each of these things. This is why you'll hear some people talk about a sacramental universe. Now that can be that can become a bit unwieldy, but that's essentially what we're talking about. Diane, you have that scrunchy look. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm okay. All right. So, we're not talking about some crass physical, you know, if you chew on the host, you're chewing God's bones. No, we're not talking about that. I was raised with that, I'm telling you. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a sacramental presence. And there's a really, really spectacular um, reference dealing with the sacramental presence. And I, I hate to say this, I'm really going to have to end with this, and I, I'm not going to get to the other three. We'll have to deal with them next week. And, we'll have, and hopefully this is answering your question that you asked last week, but if not, we can go on. But anyway, who has their Bible open right now? Turn to Jude 5. I love this passage. I'm quickly whipping around the Jude 5. Jude 5. I don't know why people say Jude chapter 1 verse 5. There's only one chapter. Okay. Who wants to read? Somebody read Jude 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Uh, what translation? King James. King James. Anybody have a different translation? Yeah. Go ahead. What translation is that, Diane? This is the uh, NIV. Oh, oh, yeah, my favorite. <laughs> Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Okay. That's about the, the spectrum. The verse says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved people out of the land of Egypt, also destroyed those who did not believe. Do you know what some of the earliest manuscripts actually read? And what in that in that passage? I'm going to read to you what some what one of the earliest manuscripts actually says. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that Jesus, having saved his people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The Greek word in that text is not Lord. The Greek word in that text is Jesus. Some of the other manuscripts have Yeshua. And if you follow one of the principles of hermeneutics, where the most difficult rendering is the correct rendering, that rendering of Jude 5 should read, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now, there's not a problem because he is the Lord, so technically that's correct. But just ponder that for one second. Jude 5. Jesus himself saved his people out of the land of Egypt. He led the Exodus. And when they disagreed, when they disbelieved, when they were standing looking at the eternal promise of the divine rest that God was going to give them, they rebelled. And he destroyed.
destroyed them. And a hush fell over the crowd. <clears throat> Scripture is amazing. And our God is amazing. And the challenge for you guys, for the rest of going through this book, and we haven't, <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the controversial <laughs> stuff yet. The challenge for you guys is this. Are you going to let God be God? And when you find out who he is, are you going to accept him as who he is? Or are you going to... Or you, or you are, yeah, if I could speak English, it'd be good. Or are you going to do what Calvin says and be one of those whose mind is a little idol maker and create a false god because you're uncomfortable with the God of Scripture? You're going to be one of those where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not going to get to the kingdom of heaven. Or you're going to be one of those that says, Psh, I'm out of here. I can't handle that. That's too much for me. Or are you going to do what Thomas did after he saw the risen Christ and he fell down on his hands and knees and he said, my Lord and my God, Okay, I went long. I apologize. Do you have any questions? We'll deal with the. We'll deal with. I'll complete this next week. This will be fast. Um, famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you fast, right? My wife is not even watching this, and she's laughing hysterically at that line. Okay, I saw a uh, count here. Uh, body and blood. How do we respond to those? Pentecostal evangelicals who call us cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was being cheeky, <laughs> I would say, when did you become a Roman citizen? Uh, because that was the same argument that the Roman made against the early Christians. Um, well, because we're not physically eating Christ's body and we're not physically drinking Christ's blood. I'm going to erase this. Um, I'm sure but if we believe really, in the real presence... Hang on. I'll get to it. Uh, for those of you that... Have you written this down? For those of you who want to take notes? Okay. I'll, let me, I'll show you what I'm talking about. First thing. Real presence doesn't mean physical presence. That's the, first, that's the first thing you have to understand. For something to be real, it doesn't have to be physical. The Holy Spirit is real, right? He's not physical. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. And I will, <laughs> I'll give you my understanding of what takes place at the Eucharist. And you don't have to believe this, but this is my understanding, okay? Again, this is heaven. All right, everything above this is heaven. And we're going to, uh, let's just do this. This is the one of the traditional symbols. Of, that's the, tr the triune Godhead, right? Okay. And we have Christ. Looks like the army Delta Force. Uh, okay, so we have Christ. Christ is the God-man, right? All right. When Christ ascended into heaven, he ascended what? Bodily, right? He's so, that so was a physical. That was a physical body, right? Okay. Which means this. Which means that his divine nature and his human nature are never separate. He will always be the God-man, right? Okay. Now, we know you're, we know that we're not eating flesh and blood because in that same passage, what did Jesus say? 
He said flesh and blood. He said flesh and bones profit little. Okay? So what's he saying when he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood? They immediately thought, oh my gosh, he's talking about cannibalism. What he was really talking about was, you need to partake of the whole person. You need to partake, you need to receive the God-man by faith. Now, how does one receive the God-man by faith? How is that possible? I have no idea. It's a miracle. The same way we accept God himself. Through faith. Well, that's the that's the instrumental means by which it happens. The bread and the wine. Okay, let's. This is my cheap altar. When when the words of consecration are uttered by the priest. Okay. When the words of con- this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of it. And the anamnesis is another very important concept, but uh, this is my blood which was shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay? When that's uttered, what the argument always becomes this. The bread and wine either Stay the same, change, become physical body and blood. This is Rome and essentially Lutherans, even though they don't don't argue that 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 is ultimately the default position. Or becomes a sacramental means of reception. Or in other words, and this one I think you'll be able to understand very easily. And and I don't disagree with you, Lynn, but there's a caveat to that your statement by faith, and that's why I didn't respond immediately. Okay, so this think of it in these terms. This is really crass. You're going to drink water. Let's say uh, it's the summer. Hot. You go over to your garden hose, right? And your garden hose is turned on, and what do you do? You drink water. You're drinking water by means of the hose. Understand? In other words, the bread and the wine are the hose. Christ is the water. The hose contains the water. The water travels through through the hose, but the hose is not the water. The bread brings Christ. We are we are ministered by the blood and the wine of Christ, but the bread and the wine is not Christ. Now here's the problem, and this is why I paused. What happens when unbelievers take this? What happens when an unbeliever walks to the rail and receives the Eucharist? According to Paul, they eat and drink damnation. Wow, somebody actually read that (laughs) bite. Now, I know I know Anglicans that deny that. It's the one of the it is one of the most significantly undertreated passages in Scripture. So, to Lynn's point, the only way you receive the blessings of the God Man, the whole Christ, the person of Christ in the mystery of the sacrament 
Because remember, the hose is not the water. The wine the wine are not the physical body and blood. But in some way, we receive all of Christ by the bread and the wine. But if we're receiving all of Christ in the bread and the wine, when we receive by faith, what happens to the unbeliever that goes forward and is then inundated with the full power of the person of Christ? He led them out of Egypt, and when they disobeyed, he destroyed them. It's a recess referencing First Corinthians. Again, do we take what we read seriously? Or do we form our own concepts of Christianity? That's a heavy, heavy idea. And this is why there are many churches. And if I had my own church, I would be very cautious allowing strangers to receive the Eucharist. I just would. It doesn't mean I would bar them if they can tell me that they had been baptized in a Trinitarian formula and they had received confirmation, I would say, oh, all right, um, all right, so you, 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 you're a believer, you, you agree with the creeds, and please, by all means. But if they don't, <laughs> even the coffee is telling me to shut up? <laughs> I, it's number three, Consubstantiation? No. No. Um, remember, uh, you, the illustration of the hose is the, is the clearest way. Uh, what, what Lutherans... What, no, what, no, okay. I'll give my Lutheran brethren a break. Cons, consubstantiation asserts the thumbnail definition of consubstantiation. That the body and blood of Christ are in, with, under, and fully present. In, in, in the bread and the wine. And that's the difference. Because we don't see the bread and the wine as something that Christ is in. We see the bread and the wine as the means through which we receive Christ. Hence the illustration of the hose. Uh, give me the same example for transubstantiation. Oh, that's that's different. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so give me a word for this grand girl. Uh, Why the three candles? Probably thanking me. Huh? Why the three candles? The three candles. Put three candles on each side of the cross. Oh, um, depends upon to whom you speak, but traditionally it is a um, a representation of the menorah that was in the tabernacle of the temple. Um, okay, transubstantiation is the difference between the Latin. Accidents. No, it's it's actually actually God love the Romans. It's actually pretty easy. Uh, it's the difference between accidents and substance. Okay. The accidents. The accidents. The actual wafer and the cup are a wafer and a cup. That's what Rome teaches. The substance, however, at the words of consecration, the substance changes the accidents metaphysically. You don't see, you don't taste, you don't feel any change in the accidents, any change in the bread and the wine. You see none of that. 
But the substance, when the priest says, this is my blood, well, I can't even say that because they actually do. Roman theology is really <laughs> weird. Um, but the, the, the actual substance becomes the physical body and blood of Christ. Bread and the wine, through your empirical senses, stays bread and wine. But the reality of the substance of what that bread and the wine is becomes the physical body and blood of Christ. Even Lutherans deny that, allegedly. Um, so, does that help? Outside of the words you don't understand? <laughs> it sort of. What, what's still muddling? What's still muddling? Well, I look at it and go, it look. It seems like it's the same thing as constitutional. Yeah, they seem like the same thing. They it, they just take a different path to get to the same end. Well, I, I will I will tell you that there are a number of thinkers that have argued that that there isn't really a no pun intended, substantial difference between the two. That essentially it's just word salad. And this is... Do you, you think it's word salad? What, do I think that, that there... I, I think... I think... I broke you. My... <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a lot of Lutheran brothers that I love dearly. Uh, but... The bottom line is I think it's a distinction without a difference. That's what I, I think it's a, uh, I, I, have, I have one of the leading dogmatic theologies by a Lutheran scholar, Franz Pieper. Brilliant, brilliant man. And when I went through his material on the Eucharist, and, well, it actually was more the communicable attributes of God, but when I went through his material and I started looking at it, he uses the same word to discuss the Lord's Supper as Romans. So it was like, okay, your own guy uses the same definition, um, and I have a, I had a very good friend that was a uh, that was a Lutheran professor, um, and again I love him dearly. And when I brought that to his attention, I actually brought people with me, and I said, "This is what he says." I read it was a couple paragraphs, it was actually a whole chapter, but I read the pertinent paragraphs. His rebuttal was, <coughs> why are you reading that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, it's a distinction without a difference to me, all right? Um, but I, you know, I, I, when I look at Lutheran theology, I, I, there are a number of concerns that uh, exist for me. But that's a different topic on a different story. Yeah. Yeah. I almost hesitate to ask you to expound <laughs> on something. Oh, gosh. But, uh, wow. This is my blood which is shed for you. Yes. Do this as oft as you shall drink it. The anamnesis, yes. What about it? Well, we drink wine socially, but the wine that is consecrated yes. as his blood. Yes. So, okay. I, I don't quite follow that. Without, uh, okay, without expounding on uh, uh, what you just asked. The key to that in this setting is the term consecration. Anything that is consecrated in the Old Testament, they, uh, we, they, earlier translations, they used to use the term sanctified. All right. So let's take just as an illustration the tabernacle. All right? What was contained in the tabernacle? We had the, the, we had the Ark of the Covenant. We had the menorah. Right? We had the showbread. Right? So we have the altar of incense. We have all of these things in, right? Now, if they were not involved in the tabernacle or the temple, they would just be furniture. Right. Right. However, they were consecrated. They were set apart 
for use unto God. And at that point, they take on a different characteristic, any different quality. All right? So it's when you're drinking wine at home, you're not sitting there saying the words of institution, I hope. Uh, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to have a different conversation. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm 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 more than willing to go. You actually asked a question about baptism like that earlier, and I, uh, and I know I'm, I'm going to answer oh, your question, Sam. Baptism. All right, conditional. Do that next week. That's okay. Oh, Sam wants to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Torah is the same. The only difference is the interpretation. We have a Christian interpretation, but the, the Torah that we have is the same as a Jewish Torah. Mm-hmm. That's that's the quick answer. Um, conditional baptism, what specifically about conditional baptism? Well, I think, let's say you're driving and you come upon an accident and you go to help somebody and you realize that they're not going to make it. And they can still communicate with you and speak with you and you ask them if they're baptized and if they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they say, no, I'm not, but yes, I do. Can you take your saliva and make the sign of the cross on their forehead and baptize them that way? Well, um, that, man, you should have just, just stuck with conditional baptism. The minute you added that, that last part. Um, all right. First of all, conditional baptism, really, there's nothing in Scripture that that says we are to conditionally baptize yeah. somebody. If thou it, art it's not just, already baptized. It's not. Baptized. It's not there. It's okay. a tradition that developed within the church okay. for that very reason. Yeah. However, it was originally developed in order to get that person who was conditionally baptized to a priest so that they could have their baptism confirmed. In the case of somebody that's dying on the road and they ask for baptism, um, I'd get a sparkless water bottle <laughs> rather than spit on their forehead. Uh, you, but you would use whatever means you had, wouldn't you? Yeah. You. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> what I would say to that is this. If the person at that moment confesses Christ, then whatever it is that you're doing, Lord willing, would be more affirmation for them before they died. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, anything else that I say, I'd have to get into a, uh, an excursus theologically, and, and it's just, I don't think it would be any more helpful than that. But, when we deal with who our God is, we must remember, among everything else, that He is merciful. And there are those situations where we have no scriptural justification other than to say that in Christ God is merciful and we would hope that his mercy would be bestowed upon that person, but it's entirely a thing. What about the example of the thief on the cross? He professed Christ, and he didn't. He wasn't baptized, but you will be with me this day in paradise. <laughs> yep, people, people use that. Are we done? Any more questions? You want to stay here till tonight? <laughs>